and welcome back to the channel. This is the Darklight Emissary, and today's video is going to cover a pretty comprehensive topic. This is going to be a longer form video on a iceberg about Warhammer 40k theories and lore, and I'm going to do my best to break down everything in this iceberg that we're going to chew through here. So, as mentioned, this is going to be a longer one, so listen to this during your work, if you can listen to it during work, or while you're building a wood marble run like I do sometimes, or whatever you're doing, uh, this will be mostly listening, and there's not going to be much visual aid to this other than the iceberg itself if you want to follow along with what I'm talking about. And as always, consider liking subscribing for more content like this. If you are new to this channel, I welcome you. There's still plenty of you discovering this channel, and a lot of you are appreciating what I've put forth so far, and I hope this video helps convince you, if you haven't already been convinced, to become part of my community here. Right now, we tend to do a live stream on Fridays, and we're going through different Warhammer games. Right now, we've been going through Battlefleet Gothic Armada 2, and after that campaign, we'll probably go into Bolt Gun and a few other Warhammer games, and I've been discussing lore with a bunch of you in the chat there, and it's been great to get to know a few of you, and I hope to get to know a few more of you, and uh, just to keep discussing this universe that we love. So without further ado, I'm going to get more into this topic here for these theories and dive straight in, because again, going to be longer, just how it is, because there's a lot here. And I do know most of it, but there's going to be a couple things that I don't know much about, and I'll say that's the case, and probably look at it a little bit before talking about it on the video, but I want to give my actual take on it, not just someone else's theory, because I feel like some of this is going to be pure theory from other people in the community, which is fine, but I want to explain what is pure theory versus having any actual lore to it, because most of this stuff that I've come across reading through this, some of it is pure theory, some of it's inspired by other theory, by actual lore, it's a mix of things, so, and some of it is just you now pure opinion, both of myself and other people putting the this on the list. So to start off with the first one, we're going to start with the top left one. The Golden Throne is failing. This is less of a theory and more of a fact. We do know that the Golden Throne from the very beginning is so esoteric that the Emperor didn't understand how it completely worked either. He knew what he could use it for, but understanding how to drive a car doesn't mean you understand how to build a car. And so it's important to note that the Emperor did not make the Golden Throne. He did find the Golden Throne, and then he augmented it further with different apparatus and things from alien species, from the Mechanicus, and he basically shaped it to do what he wanted it to do, which was to create a webway portal into the webway for humanity, essentially. And we know it works to augment his psychic ability and help maintain and control it for him, but beyond that, the Golden Throne is kind of a mystery, and because it's such a mystery, it is failing in the current era, and the Mechanicus adepts that are watching over it are clearly unable to continue to repair it or make any kind of patchwork repairs to it. So we do know that it is slowly failing. So I'm going to name that first one more of a fact over theory. Now, the next one we're going to go into is the Alpha Legion had three Primarchs, which is the top middle one here, that is, there's nothing behind it as far as I know. I know that there is probably a lot of theory around that, but in the Alpha Legion Primark book and any Alpha Legion books I've read, there's never been an indication of a third Primark ever existing at all that I have ever seen. And it's not like the Alpha Legion is a fourth wall breaking entity that they would be hiding facts from us as an audience. So we would have seen a third Primarch that no one else knew about except for Alpharius and Omegon. Or maybe let's go a bit deeper. Let's say there's a third Primarch in the Alpha Legion. And if we want to take the Alpha Legion's theme to an extreme, let's say he's so secret that not even Alpharius and Omegon know that he's there and influences the Legion. But there is literally nothing suggesting that in any of the lore that I have ever read over the last 20-ish plus years. So I consider that a pure theory that people have come up with and discussed on forums and read it over the last 20 years, but that's there's nothing indicating it as far as I know. All right, moving across the top here, Blackstone. So Blackstone, for a long time, it was a bit more unknown than it is now. You have the Blackstone Fortresses that Abaddon was interested in. 
and the Blackstone Pylons that were on Cadia. And essentially what we know from the Adominus era that we are now in, Blackstone was essentially and is essentially a anti-psyker, anti-warp, inert black stone material either created by or shaped by the Necrons primarily and the Catan back during the War in Heaven and that era of time. And we know that you can channel energy through the Blackstone pylons or through enough of them to possibly shut down things like the Eye of Terror, which was attempted and failed because Abaddon threw a Blackstone Fortress into Cadia, destroying it. And he was doing that because he knew what those pylons could do. And, you know, the Eye of Terror being shut down would ruin his plan, certainly, and those of the Chaos Gods. So Blackstone is a, was more mysterious early on. The Fortresses were more mysterious and with the end of the Cadia arc and the 13th Black Crusade, we now know more of what Blackstone is and that the Necrons certainly helped either produce it or at least found it and then shaped it to their needs and wants, essentially. The next one, uh, the top right most one here, is Origins of the Blood Ravens. Now, this one is a bit interesting because the Blood Ravens, if you don't know anything about them, are a chapter of Space Marines that were first introduced for Dawn of War. Uh, the computer, you know, the PC game, back in the early 2000s. It was a chapter created by Relic to just fill the role as their own chapter in their games. They didn't want to use the Ultramarines or someone else. They wanted to create their own. So at the very beginning, there was really no backstory to them other than, you know, here's a group of Marines, just called the Blood Ravens, that we're going to navigate our own history with. Over time, there's been a bit more lore built around them that seems to suggest that their origins are possibly Thousand Suns in origin. Uh, because the thing about the Blood Ravens is they don't know who their Primarch is, and so their Gene Seed is also suspect. Uh, no one's entirely sure where they come from, including themselves. They call their Primarch the Unknown Primarch, so they don't even know for sure where they come from. And so it's speculated that it's either the Thousand Suns, but the other one that's been interesting is the word bearers as a possible origin point as well. I have found that the word bearers one sounds more compelling, but the only problem with that for me is that the Blood Ravens have a large amount of psychers within their ranks, and that is very much a Thousand Suns thing. And then there's the whole thing with the Blood Ravens being very interested in gathering knowledge, both about their past and just in general, and hoarding it. One of the things they like to say is knowledge is power, you know, guard it well. That is kind of one of their sayings, which is very much in line with the Thousand Suns. And then on top of that, in the book A Thousand Suns, uh, you know, all about the fall of the Thousand Suns, you do have a vision near the end of the book talking about, you know, a bloody raven and, you know, a vision of the future with this raven of blood. And then you have the cult of the Corvidae within the uh, Thousand Suns, which is a cult about seeing the future and projecting the future. Ahriman was the leader of this temple of thought, which was uh, monikered by a raven. So there is a lot suggesting the Thousand Suns, but I do remember reading a theory about the word bears that was compelling, despite all the psyker stuff, which could be somewhat of a red herring. And then the other weird thing about the Blood Ravens that has kind of been memed on is they seem to obtain relics from other chapters in great amounts like in dawn of war 2 it even kind of brings us up like they have just certain armors and weapons from other chapters and like it's like who knows how these ended up in the blood ravens vaults but it's led to this joke that the blood ravens just kind of run around stealing everything from everyone else which is kind of funny but is more of a meme than actual truth we don't know how the blood ravens get some of these relics we do know they kind of behave like archaeologists, that they go seek out vaults of relics and try to find things about their origins, and maybe because of that, they do find other people's stuff and just keep it and don't necessarily even know the history of that item, so they just use it. That would be more like an in-lore reason why. Ultimately, though, the Blood Ravens are kind of a black box, and what you choose their origins to be is up to you. My opinion and my hope would be that they are Loyalist Thousand Sons because... I am a unapologetic loyalist Thousand Suns fanboy, essentially. You know, the Space Wolves suck. Thousand Suns rule. That's my 
uh, you know, very um, uncultured, just tribalistic opinion. Uh, without diving into that, I've dived into that subject before in other videos. But really, though, the Blood Ravens are an interesting top topic here because they are a little bit mysterious compared to nearly anything else in the setting, I would say. And with that's with them having some of the most exposure to, like, media being in several of the games and several of the storylines for, you know, going on two decades now. All right, next one, going across back to the left here, is the Eldar are doomed to extinction. Now, this one is, I mean, this is sort of true. I don't know about doomed to extinction, but the Eldar certainly are in a major decline. And that's going to happen when you accidentally create a murder god, essentially, you know, create it into being and it consumes billions of your species' souls. That might put a damper on your species' outlook on the future. But just as we talked about in this the last video, which was about the horrors and mysteries of Kamarag, the Eldar are certainly still a very numerous species, at least as far as the Drukhari are concerned. There are still quite a few craft worlds cruising around that have pretty good populations of Eldar aboard. And while their technological levels aren't quite at the level that they were during, you know, their highest point of their society, they're still very advanced and very able to exist and live pretty well still. So I wouldn't say they're doomed to extinction, but they certainly, you know, could over time continue to decline to that point. If the Drakari never end up, you know, dying out in Kamarag. That place is so vast and labyrinthine that there's no way that the Eldar will, you know, completely die out. That would be the part of that race I would assume would continue on indefinitely simply because of where it's located and because that society is, you know, they essentially have found a way to hack their existence, so to speak, more so than the craft worlders and definitely more so than like the Exodites or any other faction of Eldar that exists. And then, if anything, the Eldar have a new hope in the gestation of their god of death, which does, you know, have to have Eldar spirits feed into the infinity circuits on the craft worlds through their stones that take their souls when they die. That does have to be fed enough to create this god that would essentially wipe out Slanesh is the hope. Kind of brushing back up on this knowledge a little bit, I mean... The, at least the craft world Eldar believe that every Eldari apparently needs to die to for uh, Yanid to be born and to basically also rebirth the Eldari into a more balanced species apparently like it would balance out you know the extremes of Slanesh with the other extremes of the species and they would come back as a newer version of themselves much more balanced in humors and things like that. Perhaps they just think that every Eldari needs to sacrifice themselves for this to happen, and I don't see how that could happen with the Drukhari especially, considering they are very selfish beings, and they definitely do not want to die. Whereas, like, the craft worlders especially are a lot more, you know, noble intent, like, I will sacrifice myself for, you know, the greater good of my species, like, you know, they sacrifice themselves to summon avatars of Cain, you know, that kind of thing. Apparently, if this god is born, then a new dimension will be created apart from either the warp itself and the real world, the, the material universe. And then when Eldar die, they would go to Yanid and not to Slanesh. And then when Yanid is powerful enough, Yanid would do battle with Slanesh and slay She Who Thirsts, uh, you know, the Prince of Pleasure forever which would be great for that species. So I guess we'll see. I know a lot of fans for the Aldari especially are kind of frustrated with that timeline right now because essentially one of the things to create you need is apparently a crone sword, which is currently in the realm of Slanesh itself right now, which kind of makes it hard for Aldari to get to it. And also just that there's been no time progress on this subject really since it was kind of first introduced in a couple of novels. And so a lot of people feel like it's been abandoned as a storyline. I don't think so. I just think that they'll readdress it here, possibly in the shorter future, especially now that the Horus Heresy is over. All right. And so the next one we have are, where are the Tyranids coming from? So we kind of know the somewhat truth of this. This was kind of given to us in the Horus Heresy series 
there was a device in one of the books called the Pharos device, which we've learned since is partially created. Well, it was created by the Necrons. And what this device allowed for was for you to, to transport yourself between two different places instantaneously. And so this was being dabbled in by uh, Robot Goleman's forces during the heresy to try to find a way to get to Terra with it was kind of their idea with it. Long story short, the Pharos device was overcharged and a blast of psychic energy or some kind of exotic energy was blasted out of the Pharos device. This blast of light was so powerful that it was visible outside of the galaxy. And I just I remember it describing how this went down and I really liked this description because it just came across very just you know like uh, what do you call it like old gods a noble old you know decrepit alien monstrosity things in the dark watching for something sort of feeling to it and it just said that there was like thousands of eyes out in the darkness that had been watching for a long time that you know saw the light and then instantly were discarded because their use was up and that what you know they signaled the awakening of you know that species and then the tyranids started moving towards the milky way galaxy since they now knew something was there for them to be drawn to and so on a first layer the tyranids simply were hibernating in the great vastness of space in between galaxies they were at least watching and waiting for some sign of life somewhere else to go consume it is my guess. Where they came from before that, there is zero indication within the lore of where they came from. That is completely unknown. We do not know, know their origin point. Some people believe they're running from something. Some people believe that Dark Age humanity created them as some kind of failsafe to come back and attack the galaxy, or that the old ones created them as a failsafe after failing, and they're just their last option to wipe out the galaxy as kind of a vengeance. But that's all theory. There's literally no lore backing any of that up, really. I like to personally think that they are simply just a, like, galactic predator. That they're this predator species that goes around consuming galaxies, and that's their primary purpose. That's what they evolved into somehow in untold ages past. And I did a video a long time ago on the Tyranids and... I, believe I put in there as a theory that it's possible that galactic structures like the Buetes Void, which if you don't know what that is, it's a, it's a giant swath of space that we've found in real life that it's very empty of galaxies, which is very unusual. If you've seen the famous, you know, Hubble telescope image of like just a tiny fraction of black space exposed for a long time and you see the amount of galaxies just in that small grouping of space, that's what a large part of the universe looks like when we look at it but when we looked at this part of space the Boetis void had a large large just emptiness to it and so as far as in the warhammer era you know the warhammer timeline goes i've always wondered if the Boetis void is evidence of the tyranids having consumed a large amount of galaxies over the millennia and that the milky way is just the next on their you know list of uh, places they were drawn to but that is just my theory on it. Uh, there's no evidence of that. The Buetis Void has never been brought up within Warhammer. It's just my thinking on it. There is a lot of theory on the Tyranids, but hardly anything explaining exactly, you know, where they came from or what their true motives are, other than just being, you know, a very hungry, animalistic type of predator, essentially, that is intelligent, but really is just here for food, and that's it. All right, this next one, it could be a big topic all on its own. What is inside the Black Library? So the Black Library is in the webway, and it is essentially a vault that is considered to have every shred of knowledge ever about the chaos in it, about how to defeat them, and prophecies about the end times of the 40k universe itself, essentially. Kagrak, the laughing god of the Aldari, is said to be like its main protector and possibly who collected everything into the Black Library. The Black Library is said to be an Aldari craft world itself, located deep somewhere secretive within the webway itself, only known to Kegrak. Some of his Harlequins, which are the Solitaires. The Solitaires are Harlequins that have 
committed to playing the role of Solanesh in their troop plays that kind of depict the fall of their species. And so essentially their souls are forfeit to Solanesh, which is interesting. So the only members of their species that tend to go there are ones condemned to be consumed by Solanesh just by their job, essentially, which is weird and kind of cool. There are several Farseers that do go there occasionally, and this is the, again, like the biggest knowledge dump about the warp, the chaos gods, their secrets, their promises, everything, creatures, all of it. Anything compiled by the Aldari over millions of years is here in this vault. And so it's guarded by the Harlequins, as well as I remember hearing a long time ago that there could be some Krork that guard it. So the predecessors to the orcs themselves could be guarding this as well, some of that species still. And so because the knowledge in this place is essentially priceless and very important to fighting chaos and understanding it in ways that could not be understood otherwise, it's been a target of several inquisitors of the Imperium, as well as beings like Ahriman and others who seek its knowledge for their own personal gain and reasons. Sometimes this place does allow certain individuals in, and it has allowed at least a couple of inquisitors in uh, by choice to interact with a few things, although this is incredibly rare to be done, but it does show that the Aldari that run the Black Library do see a benefit at times, at least for themselves, to let some members of humanity that can be trusted to look at some of the knowledge that's in there to help fight against chaos, since that is something that the Aldari and the Imperium definitely have a vested interest in helping each other defeat, even if they don't like each other, ultimately. And then one of the most interesting knowledge things that have come out of the Black Library is there's essentially some kind of writing in something known as the Rana Dandra that shows something called Kegrak's ultimate jest. And essentially what that is, is Kegrak tricking Selenash into expending her power to save the Aldari ultimately through some way, through Kegrak's trickery. And this might be somewhat involved in uh, with the Yanid as well, but there's nothing tying the two together really. This could be some kind of alternate solution by Kegrak. We don't know really what Kegrak's ideas are regarding the Yanari and whether he likes that outcome or not. But with Kegrak being one of the oldest enemies of Chaos and Slanesh in particular, it can be determined that Kegrak is probably willing to, you know, trick Slanesh into maybe expending all of their energy into Yanid itself. We aren't sure, I guess, but just an interesting tidbit from the Black Library itself here. All right, the next topic we're going over is the next one on the list here, which is the Nine Artifacts of Vulcan. And really, this is pretty straightforward. Essentially, it's a legend amongst the Salamanders, Space Marines, that their Primarch Vulcan will be found when they find nine artifacts of their Primarch scattered and left by the Vul Vulcan throughout the galaxy, essentially. And apparently, so far, the Salamanders have found five of the artifacts, which three of which are known as the Spear of Vulcan, Kasari's Mantle, and the Gauntlet of the Forge. And these are wielded by the current chapter master or forge father of the Salamanders, Vulcan Hiestan, or Heston. And then there's two other ones, the Chalice of Fire and Eye of Vulcan, that are kept on the moon of Prometheus in their fortress monastery. And then the last four have not been found yet, and these are named as the Engine of Woes, the Obsidian Chariot, the Unbound Flame, and the Song of Entropy. Somehow, either Vulcan will be found with the final artifact, or know when the final one is found, and it'll send out some signal, and then Vulcan will come and judge whether the Salamanders are ready for his leadership again or not, essentially is what the legend says from their sacred tome of fire. Alright, this next one is the Machine Spirit is what powers the Orc Machines. And just up front, uh, before this iceberg, I've really never seen anyone talk about this as a possibility ever in all the time I've read lore. So this is a theory, at least among some people, I imagine. But as far as I'm aware, there has never been any inkling within the lore or canon that supports this. Yeah, I think it's just considered an irony if 
the Omnissiah is powering the enemies of the Imperium, too, is kind of, the, I think, the suggestion here. But there is nothing indicating that about Orc machinery at all, as far as I know. I've never read anything supporting it, and so I don't really have much to say on it other than that, uh, in my own opinion and knowledge that I know of. Okay, next is the missing Primarchs. So the missing Primarchs are a big topic. A lot of theory surrounds them. There's been hints and mentionings of them throughout the Horse Heresy series of books for the last 20 years. And what it all essentially boils down to is, well, first off, if you want to get a more dive into this, I'll try to remember to link a video here around this mark that goes into what I think about the missing Primarchs. And there's a whole video I dedicated to that a long time ago that you can go look at. But in very quick terms, what I guess it's is assumed at this point is that the missing Primarchs were at the very least possibly banished and at the very most possibly executed by either the Space Wolves and Lemon Russ or by the Lion and the Dark Angels. Um, there is some prevailing theory that it could be the Dark Angels that did it because one thing I did read recently, which was in the uh, Sons of the Forest book, which has the lion returning to the current setting, is a lion kind of musing that the Dark Angels were who you sent to destroy something without anyone knowing, and Russ is who you sent when you wanted to make it a spectacle. And I wouldn't call the missing Primarchs a spectacle. No one really knows about their existence other than the other Primarchs who are sworn to secrecy to ever even talk about it, really. And so, while Russ is known as the Emperor's Executioner, the Lion could be known as the Emperor's Destroyer and Silent Executioner, I guess, for things that he does not want anyone to know about. So my vote to go to the Lion, having executed the two missing Primarchs, if that's what happened. And then it is assumed and partially confirmed that the legions of these missing Primarchs were absorbed into legions like the Ultramarines as well as the Imperial Fists, and maybe a few others as well. Beyond that, there is a lot of theory about the missing Primarchs that I'm not going to get into here, but that is the main thought process. And then the one other thing I'll bring up is one of the original creators of Warhammer did mention that he believes, at least his lore when he created it, was that the Emperor actually was forgetting these two Primarchs in a way to forgive them of whatever they did, and that he didn't kill them and that they were allowed to go do whatever they wanted, as long as it was without humanity, apparently. That's kind of the way he described it when I read, went and read about that. Now, I'm not personally well-versed in any true purpose theories for the Celestial Ori, but what it is, is essentially the Necrons own a device that can see the galaxy in real time, like every star system, everything and in kind of like a hologram type form but beyond just having a simulation of the galaxy they have the ability to manipulate it so they can cause any star within the galaxy to go supernova and so they have great power involved within this orrery but the current dynasty of necrons that own it basically use it to caretake the galaxy in a way that you could almost imagine someone caretaking a garden they are very careful with systems they cause to go supernova and they don't seem to really have any power gain dreams from that so you know they're not using it to destroy you know the imperium of man by wiping out the sun around terra or other key worlds and they seem to really care about the galaxy so to speak which is interesting for necrons considering they are essentially eternal death robots but uh just to, really with the true purpose of it i mean the troopers of the Ori, at least for the Necrons currently, is the Necrons believe they are the true rulers of the galaxy. And I assume that this dynasty that rules the Ori truly believes that in a benevolent way, so to speak. But really, it's just a potential doomsday weapon as well. You know, if you can just, at the swipe of a hand, wipe every solar system out, wipe out every star, you know, that's a lot of power concentrated in one place and... How exactly that works, who exactly knows. Essentially, some of the Necrons view it as just a work of art and nothing more than that, which kind of speaks to just how high-tech the Necrons are that 
They view something that can wipe out the galaxy as simply a form of art for their species. And then one of the other things that makes the orrery interesting is it's real time what the galaxy looks like at that time. So if you do destroy one of the orrery stars, it will instantaneously cause that sun to go supernova. So again, a lot of destructive power latent in this machinery, but it seems, I don't think anything's ever going to happen with it much because, you know, it's one of those things that's just so over the top, even for 40k, that it's kind of fun to, you know, hint at and suggest and show it being there, but then never really do anything with it much. All right, next is the Event Horizon, or Event Horizon is a prequel to the Warhammer 40k universe. And so this is just a fun one. I'm sure a lot of you listening to this know of this theory that the movie Event Horizon is essentially kind of a proto Warhammer movie about like the first warp jump essentially that humanity took. And it's fun to think about it that way. And there's some things pointing to that. Apparently, at least one of the writers and a few other people working on that movie were fans of 40k. The design of the ship itself, which is called the Event Horizon, it definitely has kind of like this crenellated gothic stylization that fits within Warhammer. And then the idea of a ship jumping into, you know, a different space time to complete faster than light travel and coming back changed or demented from like a hell dimension is very much in keeping with jumping into the warp for the first time without a Geller field, I imagine. So it definitely fits as like, you know, humanity's first baby step into discovering the warp, but there is no official lore connecting it to 40k. It's just a fun fan theory and fun, you know, headcanon thing for people really at this point. All right, next is Chthonia. Now, Chthonia is the supposed homeworld of Horus, who was the first found son of the emperor, one of his primarchs during the Great Crusade. Horus was famously with the emperor the longest out of all of his sons, and so that kind of helps speak to the tragedy of the Horus heresy and his betrayal, considering that Horus was at the Emperor's side the longest, and that's part of why Horus was chosen as the War Master, because the Emperor trusted him, possibly favorited him the most, and Horus also proved himself to be a great diplomat and warrior and strategist all in one, essentially. But for all of that, Chthonia itself is rarely talked about in the Heresy series. We do know that the Sons of Horus recruited from that world, and that a lot of the members of that legion do come from Chthonia, as well as Terra. And it should be noted that this world is within non-light travel distance of Terra, so you could get there fairly quickly, by means not through warp travel, which is really close for a star system. But for all of that, it's hardly ever talked about, and for all of the pride that the Sons of Horus had, and as the Luna Wolves before that, they really didn't seem to take pride in their world. If anything, they seem to kind of hide it or almost be ashamed of it in some senses. Like, they will talk about it, but they don't really talk about it. Whereas, like, some legions, they talk a lot about their homeworld, right? Like, the Space Wolves, they love Fenris, and they will talk your ear off about Fenris, tell you all kinds of legends about it if you bring it up to a Space Wolf, I would imagine. And going along with this... Horus never really talks about it, and it's theorized that he might not even have come from Chthonia, that that is like something the Emperor just made up and that Horus went along with for whatever reason. And then for how famous Horus is, his origins and upbringing as a Primarch is one of the most unknown upbringings out of all of the Primarchs. Some of them we know basically everything about, you know, how they were raised, who raised them, on what world, what kind of culture raised them. You know, things that inform why they are the way they are. Horus, we do not really know much. And I do know there was like a short story about Horus. There isn't a Primark novel about his origins, really, that I've seen. Yeah, so re-looking at the list of Primark novels, there is 17 of them. And guess what's missing? The one about Horus himself, which is interestingly conspicuous. It's weird to think that we know more about Alpharius' origins now in Omegons than we know about literally one of the top 
figures and the entire setting and, you know, the name for the horse heresy itself, Horus himself. And the only thing I can recall is there was a short story with Horus on Chthonia, but he was known as Nergui or Nergui. It's spelled N-E-R-G-U-I. And apparently this translates to meaning no name. And then his adoptive father on Chthonia at one point names him Horus. And then Horus also hears psychically it's time from the emperor. And at this point as Nergui, he doesn't have a Primarch's body or physique or anything like that at all. He's actually stunted and seemingly a weak child. And when these events play out, he, his body transforms into a Primarch body at that point, and he even gains a bunch of knowledge and things that... It's really odd compared to any of the other Primarch origins because the Emperor contacts him psychically and then doesn't seem to appear in person right away. Whereas with nearly every other Primarch, if not every other Primarch found, the Emperor went there personally, and these Primarchs either sometimes knew the Emperor was coming or had some kind of vision of it, or they had no clue and the Emperor shows up after hearing about some being, you know, uniting that sector in an unusual way. And he goes there and it's one of his lost sons. Not so with Horus. Horus didn't seem to unite Chthonia or become a leader of it or anything. And beyond that, everything else is obscured about Horus, seemingly by design by the Emperor for whatever reason. And he, that's still the last Primarch book that we have not gotten other than the two missing Primarchs for obvious reasons. It's very strange, and so this is a good entry on this iceberg because, like, this is one of the last grand mysteries, so to speak, from the heresy. There's not much about Chthonia at all. I will say that in this last novel of the entire series and in the Death Part 3, we do have one point in the fight with the Emperor versus Horus where the Emperor uses Chthonia as... A weapon, so to speak, against Horus, at least the memory of Chthonia, seeming to indicate that Horus has no desire to go back there or really, like, want to think about it. The Emperor seemed to think that using it was, in some way, a way to get under Horus' skin somehow during that fight. I'm not sure, but it's one of the only times we see them on Chthonia in some way, and it mentioned really at all throughout the series much. Definitely a strange one, and we still don't have any answers of that, and now with the Heresy series over, it's odd that that Primark novel has not come out before the ending of the series, and it will be very, very sought after once it does come out, because they can't leave it not out at all, I don't think. Alright, next is Gork and Mork. So, if you're unfamiliar with these two, they are essentially the gods of the orcs themselves. They are considered warp gods in their own right, but they're almost hive mindish. Like Gork and Mark don't really have a super, you know, like ability to like direct the orcs really. They're more like a reflection of the orcs in the pure sense as a psionic gestalt within the warp itself and kind of is a feedback for that. So if you've ever wondered why you don't see any chaos orcs really, it's because essentially their own psychic gestalt and hive mind of their own combined with these simple versions of gods and the warp so to speak basically insulate them from the corrupt parts of the warp and the chaos gods and their predations essentially and so there's not really too much more to say about gork and mork here they are essentially just the manifestation of orc will in the imperium and the orcs are you know, for being for being war-oriented and for being willing to fight each other, they're still one of the most united species in the entire galaxy in a lot of ways, and this manifests as those two beings within the warp itself. I suppose one of the more interesting things about Gork and Mork is that, even though they are some kind of form of warp entity or god for the orcs, this doesn't manifest as any sort of demon, orc, creature of any kind, with really the orc race itself is kind of the manifestation of these gods in a roundabout way which is a bit different from you know the other warp entities whereas whether it's the emperor with the legion of the damned kind of manifesting on his behalf or 
for Chaos Gods and their demons manifesting for their aspects. The Gods of the Orcs don't have the same thing, which I find kind of interesting as a main difference for their entities versus the other ones. There is an excerpt provided of a demon basically seeing how the orcs think, and it basically says even the blood god, mightiest of the ruinous powers, could not offer them any outlet for their warlike nature that was not provided by worship of their own brutish gods. The abhorrence proliferated, vermin with an infuriating inability to acknowledge the power of chaos. So, essentially, they, you know, worship themselves in a sense through their two gods, and this kind of self-feedback loop kind of prevents the orcs from being corruptible by chaos or tantalized by it like the other races tend to be. All right, and last for the tip of this iceberg is Urda scattered the Primarchs. So I don't know exactly when this iceberg was created, but this is confirmed as of some of the later Horse Heresy novels. Urda does say that she did scatter the Primarchs because she didn't agree with the Emperor on how he planned to use the Primarchs, and she helped create them essentially. And so she says she scattered them as kind of a way to, you know, stop the Emperor's plans. But then she just kind of was hands off after that and didn't do anything else. And so she, in a way, kind of caused the heresy in a roundabout way because of that, in some ways, at least caused the corruption of some of her sons, essentially. And so this was confirmed. There is a little bit of ambiguity here because we do have two visions from Horus at the beginning of the heresy series as well as some word bearers given a vision of the Imperial Dungeon where the Primarchs were kept in capsules. In both of those visions, there is no sign of Erda being there. And that could just be Erda not simply being invented yet by Games Workshop for the series yet. Or it could be suggesting that Erda's story is a lie herself and that whatever motivation she had for lying, we aren't sure on. But... This is likely true, that she was the true cause of the scattering, and that those visions, both of those visions were given by the Chaos Gods, which have reasons to lie. Although in the second one, with the word bearers, those, those marines weren't really deceived per se, or had any reason to be perceived at that, deceived at that point like Horus did. But anyway, I mean, that's the only thing going against those, is that it was, they were literal visions by you know, the, the gods that are kind of perpetually kind of, uh, what do you call it? Uh, they are compulsive liars. Zench, of course, most of all, but it is always said that demons by their very nature lie when they talk. So they might have some truth weaved within the lies that they tell, but they are never telling you the whole truth or the full truth, really. It's always twisted for their own ends, essentially. All right, and so the next part of the iceberg. I think we're going to do this second part and then see how this video does. So if you want to go past the second part and you're enjoying this, be sure to like this video so far if you're still here and to subscribe and to comment about this video and discuss it. If this gets a good result, I'll definitely dive into more of the iceberg. But what I don't want to be doing is creating super long videos that take more editing work and things like that. And then, you know, getting like 200 views on it, not really worth making these other than for the fun of it, which I do like to do because there's a lot of stuff to just talk about here, but I would like to see some success from it. So if you want to help be part of the success and you're enjoying this video, please ensure that you tell YouTube that in the ways that you can. But I digress. We're going to dive straight into the second part of the iceberg here. So the first of the second iceberg is there are actually two 40k timelines. Now, I hadn't really heard much about this until looking at this iceberg, but essentially from what I read about it a bit, the, because the beginning of the Warhammer franchise was essentially very different in the late 80s when it started to now, the idea is that the original, you know, few years, first decade of Warhammer 40k is actually a separate timeline completely with its own lore compared to the current timeline that we mostly look at now because the way space marines were characterized, the way the space, the way the emperor was characterized, even his origins were more solid. Just a lot of things were different lore wise. And instead of, you know, considering that just straight up retcon, some people decided that that could simply be another timeline split 
for 40k. There has never really been much suggesting this. There hasn't been, like, any incident of a space brain going through, like, a dimensional portal to another interpretation of things. And so, like, there's no indication of this. And only a couple of times have we seen any form of time travel of any sort in the setting. And this is usually done very, very sparingly. And they have never witnessed any differences either that I can recall reading those entries anywhere. And so we'll jump into the next one, which is Commissar Yarrick is not dead. This is essentially just fans of Commissar Yarrick being frustrated that in one of the latest, you know, like codex updates for things, there's just an entry that Commissar Yarrick has died and people really liked Yarrick and don't want him dead. And so they have kind of considered this entry to possibly be propaganda or you know, false news by the Imperium not knowing if he's dead or not and just recording it as death. There's been a lot of pushback on that that I've seen for those that love the character of Commissar Yarek. All right, next is that Alpharius, or they say Alpharion here, assuming, I guess, Alfari Alpharius Omegon, was the first Primarch found by the Emperor and was raised in secrecy. This has some water as a theory, at least if you go with the Primarch novel for Alpharius being completely true in that Alpharius claims he was found on Terra itself, which if his capsule crashed on Terra itself, you know, he would have been the first found. And then he was supposedly raised in secrecy from that point on. But that's Alpharius telling it. And while I do believe a large part of that novel is true and that Alpharius isn't, doesn't really have a reason to lie in that novel. If anything, I, I view the Alpharius Primark novel as like his journal entry, his personal journal entry for getting the truth out somewhere since his life is mostly secrecy. He wanted to have something that was stable and true that he could at least read or reflect on or that could come out about him in the future after his death per se or something like that. And so really, I mean, this is a possibility. We, I guess, certainly don't for sure 1000% know that Alpharius was found on Terra, but I do think it kind of makes sense because the Alpha Legion was kind of trusted with the Emperor's secrets in a lot of way, uh, and we know that the Alpha Legion was active for a long time before being announced as a Legion, seemingly at the behest of the Emperor's mission as well as Malkador's, so they were an important apparatus, and this is a large part of my theory that a large portion of the Alpha Legion is probably still Loyalist, despite us not knowing that in the current era, but they seem to have been used extensively by the Emperor and his kind of more secret side of governance that we often see through Malkador. So anyway, that's kind of my thoughts on that, really. This next one is a bit strange to me reading it. Conrad Kurtz faked his death, mostly because this is one of the most blatant, like in our face, deaths we've witnessed in a book, really. This might be an older theory, mostly before... We got the Night Lord's Omnibus by Aaron Dembski Bowden, which seemed to really show a lot of Marines witnessing the actual death of their Primarch and him wanting it to happen, as the lore has said for a long time. There was a post I saw on an old forum from like, you know, 14 years ago now, before that novel, before those novels came out, long before they came out, that seemed to theorize that maybe the first captain of the Night Lords, which there was a book about back then that also talked about the death of Conrad a bit. It was one of the earliest times, I think, that we had much said about Conrad and about his death, really, and anything set during, like, the period of time between the Heresy and the 40k era. And there was some kind of theory that uh, Sahal, the first captain there, basically almost faked, helped fake the death with Conrad. But as of now, as of right now, I don't believe that for one bit. We do seem to have had Conrad killed on screen, so to speak. And anytime characters tend to be killed, quote unquote, on screen in Warhammer, they tend to actually be dead. And so it does seem to me that Conrad did really want to die. And Conrad is interesting as a character because for being kind of this cloak and dagger stealth assassin type of character in a lot of ways, this terror assassin, so to speak, he was not super deceptive. He was actually pretty honest and straightforward as a character. 
And so it doesn't really make sense that he would want to fake his own death, in my opinion. I think he really did want to die to kind of prove himself right. As he said, death is the greatest form of vindication. And I think he really believed that. Next is the Monroe's murdered the lost Primarchs. And I don't ascribe to this theory at all. Uh, we talked a bit about this in the previous part of the iceberg with the missing Primarchs. It has been said, at least mused on by the lion, that if you want something done without anyone knowing about it, you send him, not Russ. And, you know, Russ was sent to, like, Prospero to wipe out the suns. Well, to arrest Magnus, but he ended up wiping out the suns there. And that was certainly a spectacle type of thing. While the Space Wolves can be considered the, you know, some of the most loyal sons of the Emperor. They are not really his most subtle sons, so to speak. So I don't know if I believe that they had any hand with the missing Primarchs at all, that they executed them or did anything with them, really. We do have absolute proof that the Dark Angels were present for the Rangdan Xenocides. And there is some rumor and, you know, rumblings of one or both of the lost Primarchs being present for that conflict and possibly being consumed by it in some way. Which would lead to me to believe that this lion and the Dark Angels maybe had a hand in at least one of their deaths, at the very least. But ultimately, there's a lot of conjecture around all of this, and I just personally don't think now, after everything I know, that Russ did anything with the Lost Primarchs, and that if you asked him, he might say something to suggest he did, kind of in jest, because that's Russ's personality to, like, say, oh yeah, you know, I totally killed those guys, or to suggest it, he's like, you know, I'm not saying that I did it, but, you know, you know, I could see him doing something to that effect, essentially. Next, we have the Emperor burning Nurgle's Plague Garden has set Isha free. So, Isha is one of the other living gods of the Eldar pantheon to still exist. She was captured by Nurgle instead of consumed by Slaanesh, and the whole thing with her is she's able to heal any disease, really. She's able to, like, rejuvenate anyone, essentially, and Nurgle has been testing diseases out on her and seeing how fast she's able to recover from them to determine how virulent his diseases are, essentially. And so, in the last book of the Dark Imperium trilogy, which is God Blight, we have Robot Goleman being inhabited by the Emperor, essentially, and being in a part of Nurgle's garden. Using the Emperor's sword, he brings it down and sends like a wave of flame, psionic flame through the garden and burns a swath of it. And so I could see this being a possible outcome that Isha was set free. But the only thing against this, I guess, is that one thing mentioned in this part of the book is that we can see the basically the mansion that Nurgle supposedly lives in, which is essentially Nurgle himself personified in the middle. It's this gigantic decrepit structure in the middle of the swamp centrally and inside of it is said to be Nurgle and he's in there creating his diseases constantly and that's where he's said to live is in there and then within there would be Isha in her cage essentially near Nurgle at all times I imagine except for when Nurgle I guess leaves to go hang out in his garden so to speak but if that's the case there was no indication that the fire ever reached that mansion and or touched it at all or burned it because essentially the emperor said at this time that you know Nurgle was like there was a part for Nurgle to play that Nurgle like he didn't have necessarily a true need to attack Nurgle directly and really he was sending a message by burning part of the garden at this point so I would think we would have had to see his mansion on fire to determine whether you know Nurgle had to vacate that mansion for a time and then leaving Isha behind in almost a panic. I could see her getting out in that point, but there was no talk of Isha there or indication of her escape at all. And so I'm going to firmly put this in just, you know, what people have said online and, and discussed after this book came out as a possibility. But until something gets actually penned down in a novel for us to read that this happened, we have no indication that it did happen. All right, next is... The Men of Iron is listed here. So the Men of Iron, we just talked about in our mysteries and horrors of the Dark Age of Technology timeline of events. 
and I'll link a video here to that as kind of a deeper dive on this subject. But essentially the men of iron were a form of AI that at the height of technological prowess that humanity was at created and the men of iron end up in some kind of rebellion against humanity and helped cause the downfall of humanity into the age of strife and old night and all of that and helped cause the fear of AI in the current era by the current Imperium and the Mechanicus. And uh, essentially the men of iron were a pretty powerful AI species and they essentially, I, mean, I imagine they had access to some pretty powerful technology, some of which I mention in that video, things that could devour not only real space, but part of the warp itself, things that could strip planets bare to the bedrock in, I imagine, days, if not hours. Just very powerful things that they probably had access to. And apparently one of the theories around the Men of Iron is that they were essentially some kind of good guys within that time period and that the decisions they made were meant to help save humanity and were perhaps like in witness of the psyker gene manifesting and seeing that kind of issue, things like that. One of the theories is just that the Men of Iron were essentially a slave revolt. There's several theories around them and there is not a ton else really mentioned too much about them much. And that's really all I'll say about that. I, do, I don't know a ton about the theories on the Men of Iron other than that they were AI and that there was a war involving them, but we really don't know their motivations or their desires, their wants. We don't know too much about what this war was truly fought over. All right, this next one I'm not too familiar with, but it says, what technological knowledge was forbidden by Ferris Manus? And then in parentheses it has here, the keys of hell. And it's spelled H-E-L. Looking at a couple of discussions on this, this seems to be a line of technology that Ferris forbid the Iron Hands from dabbling in that dealt with resurrecting them from death, essentially. Like, dealing with technology that might have Necron origins. And the Necrons are all about, you know, being resurrected from death back to life and being very hard to kill. And apparently something about this technology was either corrupting or at least feared by Ferris, if not made him concerned. And so he knew that his sons, the Iron Hands essentially really loved technology to a degree that Ferris was not okay with. And after his death, they kind of went extreme on that side of things to the point where it is essentially assumed and rumored that some Iron Hands are completely machine now, that over time, like even their brains are cybernetic, which would kind of brush right up against laws against AI and the Imperium, essentially. But no one really wants to go have that fight with the Iron Hands, essentially. So it's just kind of a rumor. But if that's the case, that could lead into this Keys of Hell theory that maybe the Iron Hands have unlocked this stuff, essentially. Now that, you know, Ferris has been dead for a very long time and in their bitterness, they would want, I think, any power given to them technologically to fight the forces of the warp and chaos and the emperor's children anyone they assume had a hand in the death of their primarch which they did definitely did not take well there is from an excerpt a really cool line that just simply asks what are the keys of hell and the response is they are the reward for our weakness they are the cruelty of iron they are all we have left seeming to indicate this might be the case that the iron hands are essentially bringing back and keeping alive their men basically as kind of like a fanatical take on technology and almost say by any means necessary we're gonna you know fight our enemies sort of mentality all right next we have here is simply neoth which was a name that urda claimed the emperor went by when she knew him long before he was the emperor of mankind and I went and looked around at a couple theories regarding this, and essentially I think the theory revolves around Neoth being a name for, you know, him as a more human version of himself, and that he was not the Emperor in personality until after he went to Molech and gained whatever knowledge there, and that's what changed him into the Emperor of Man persona fully, which seemed to indicate that he was less than human 
in more like a god in form. Although in one of the conversations the Emperor has with Malkador, he says essentially that, you know, I don't intend to become a god and that, you know, essentially, but I might lose part of myself still in this whole process of things. And this comes from the birth of the Imperium novel. And so really, I think the theory around this is just that Neoth was the last true version of the Emperor as like a human person, because Erda does mention that, you know, she considered Neoth funny and like charismatic to be around and kind of just a good time to be around, which is why she fell in love with him, so to speak, and also intelligent, just a whole bunch of things. And he was already more than the other perpetuals like her. And so she was drawn to him. And so I think that's kind of what this is talking about, essentially, really. And that's all I really have to say about that right now. I might look into that topic a bit more and dive in on like a focused video on that subject. Next is the Dragon of Mars is the Void Dragon. And this is essentially almost completely validated as true, I would say. We, for the most part, know that it's most likely a shard of the Void Dragon on Mars that the Emperor brought there in Earth's prehistory somehow after fighting and defeating it on Earth. And this is surrounding an old myth or legend of St. George who, in English myth, battled the dragon back then. And so it was kind of suggested there that the Emperor defeated this shard of the dragon somehow and then somehow took it to Mars. And so I would measure this more as more close to actual fact than theory, although I will say it's never been outright confirmed that the Void Dragon is what's underneath Mars and helped cause the Mechanicus technological advances, but there's a lot pointing towards it, and I believe that I talked a lot about this in my Catan video recently, and so I'll give a link to that here in this video right around this mark for you if you want to go look at that. All right, next we have the Rangdan Xenocides. This is a gigantic topic, and I don't recall right now on the top of my head if I did a full-on video about the Rangdan itself, but essentially this is an era of time that happened during the Great Crusade that is essentially sealed away by order of the Emperor and the Imperium itself. It was the darkest time that the Imperium early on endured, other than the Horus Heresy. There was entire swaths of legions wiped out. There was entire Titan legions destroyed. It's rumored that one or both of the missing legions met their fate here. We know the Dark Angels got savaged here and were a major force fighting the Rangdan there. And that kind of is how the Dark Angels got partially their name for being such a deadly force of Marines because they survived that conflict and came out on top, but they were also greatly wounded by that conflict. And so because there's so much expungement of knowledge and that, you know, basically the current 40k era knows nothing of this anymore, really the only being in the current era that would know about the ranked and xenocides really would be uh, Robout Goleman himself. And then if Constantine Valder is alive, he would know about it. And then of course, I guess the lion himself, now that he's back, would possibly know the most about the Rangdan Xenocides, considering in the Sons of the Forest novel, we actually do have some mention of the Rangdan by some of the fallen space marines that are from the Heresy era, remembering them fighting on some of the like ships of the Rangdan, things like that. But essentially the Rangdan were a very powerful Xeno species or empire. That might have been an amalgamation of several species all working together against the Imperium. There's some suggestion of that, like there's a Xeno species called the Sloth, who are horrifying and seem to have either been controlling the Rangdan, or at least following in the Rangdan's wake wherever they went. They seem to go hand in hand, and in the current era, the Rangdan don't seem to be around, but the Sloth are still around to some degree, as far as we know. The, the Sloth are basically in competition for the most grotesque creations of biology next to like the homunculi and the Drukhari labs essentially and uh, they're absolutely horrifying and involved in this so really the Rangdan xenocides the theories surrounding it are that you know the missing primarchs were either brainwashed by the Rangdan and used there or 
something like that happened there or some other theories I know of personally are like the Xenocides of the Rangdan were the reason why the Emperor switched the Imperium's policies to be so virulently anti-Xenos because the Rangdan were so horrifying that that is kind of what permanently switched the Imperium to be like, we're not going to trust any Xenos from now on really, other than like the Eldari sometimes. So that's really what I'll say about the Xenocides here. This is kind of a deep topic despite being mostly theories, but there's a lot of theories surrounding the Rangdan. Next is that Corn is the most dominant chaos god, and I mean, I essentially the chaos gods kind of take turns being most ascendant in real space, so to speak, and within the great game, as the conflict between the four of them is known as. And it would make sense for Corn to possibly be in ascendance, considering you know we're in a setting that starts off with saying that you know in the cold darkness of the 41st millennium, there's only war. Corn is the blood god and war god of the setting, it would stand a reason that he would be one of the most dominant chaos gods right now. And, uh, I mean, it makes perfect sense. There's plenty of blood flowing to make Corn happy, essentially. And so, I don't know what theory this would really be talking about, about because it is really a theory based on a lot of accurate lore, just by the lore existing, really essentially. I've been playing a lot of Total Warhammer 3, and while Total Warhammer takes place in the fantasy version of Warhammer, the Chaos Gods are, for the most part, pretty similar to their 40k versions of themselves, and all through the campaign for that game, you have different Chaos Gods rising in ascendance, you know, for several turns within the game, just saying that this one now has ris risen to ascendance, and so I imagine over time, each of the Chaos Gods is the most dominant in different ways. Like, for example, I would say during the Horus Heresy, it's possible Zench was the most dominant over Korn, simply because, you know, the Horus Heresy took a lot of plotting and deceivery, at least at first, before the war actually broke out. And then I believe once that war broke out, all that would feed Korn. And so just by that happening and continuing on for 10,000 years, it would make sense that the war god gets empowered by all that fighting. On a more meta level, He's just an easier god to portray in media and artwork and things like that and in motivation versus something a bit more weird like Zench, for example, or Slanesh, which is kind of a often portrayed not safe for work like, even though Slanesh is much more than that. Next is a really good one. I could talk at length about this. Lorgar regrets betraying the Emperor. And so... I know a fair bit about this since the Horse Heresy is essentially my specialization, I would say, within the lore, because I've been reading it for so long. And The First Heretic is one of my favorite novels in the Horse Heresy series. And that novel chronicles Lorgar's journey to become, you know, the chief architect in a lot of ways for the Horse Heresy itself, and also an adopter of the Chaos Gods as his pantheon he worships as gods instead of the Emperor himself. But I think it's possible on some level. Lorgard does betray or does regret betraying the Emperor on some level because Lorgar is never depicted as especially nefarious. That's kind of left to his two side characters, Corferon and Erebus, who, if you're at all familiar with the lore, you know Erebus. And really, those two are the more deceiving types and kind of Machiavellian, mustache twirling villain types, whereas Lorgar kind of portrays himself as more like kind of a martyred character in some ways. His book of Lorgar, which is kind of his chaos book of knowledge, it, the beginning of it kind of starts off with, just remember, I did not seek all this out, hoping for any of this to be real, but it is real. And if anything, to a degree, I regret that this knowledge is real, but it's real. And I believe that it's the way for humanity to ascend, essentially, is to worship the chaos gods is kind of how his book starts out. And more interestingly, you know, Lorgar was wounded by the Emperor, chastising him for worshipping him as a god. Lorgar loved the Emperor, and his legion was, you know, one of the most populated legions, one of the most powerful legions, and they all worshipped the Emperor as a god. I do believe that them finding real gods, so to speak, within the warp actually validated 
Lorgar's beliefs in the Emperor as a god. So I do believe that Lorgar believes that the Emperor is some form of god still. And that I think his regret would be more that, you know, there could not be some kind of happy alliance between the Emperor and the Chaos Gods. So I believe it's possible if you were to sit down with Lorgar and speak about it, he would say something to the effect of, you know, I do on a level regret that I couldn't have just been happy with the Emperor as my god and that he wouldn't accept my worship. I don't really like a lot of the things that Chaos Gods represent, but they are real. They desire their own things, and I believe it's possible for humanity to gain the most by worshipping them and not simply be consumed or destroyed by them. And I believe this is most well depicted by a short story where basically at this point in time, Fulgrim is currently being possessed by a Slanesh demon prince or greater demon. And Lorgar notices this and Lorgar is upset by this fact because Lorgar's whole thing with wanting chaos to become ascendant is to somehow unite humanity with it equally, have them be on equal terms, where the where chaos benefits humanity as much as humanity benefits chaos. And what he saw in Fulgrim there was a perversion of that, and he wanted to basically pull the demon out of Fulgrim completely. And I don't remember why he doesn't do that, but essentially I just find it interesting that despite Lorgar laying the groundwork for such things to happen, he wanted them to happen in a certain way that would benefit humanity. And so Lorgar is kind of the ultimate like chaos apologist in a sense for humanity's benefit ultimately. Whereas like Erebus or Corfiron simply just wants to essentially burn everything for their own power. Lorgar doesn't want to do that. And in, so in that way, in some ways, I think he could regret betraying the Emperor or at least betraying humanity and betraying some of his brothers as well. In some ways, I consider Lorgar the personification of the saying, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Lorgar has every good intention, even if the outcome is not what he intended. I don't believe Lorgar is truly evil in like the most obvious way. He's evil in a sense of like his purpose being so certain in his mind that he can't see any other way to bring it about. And he's like evil without really knowing he's evil, so to speak. Whereas like, I believe like Erebus just knows he's evil. You know, he knows what he's doing, that sort of, that sort of thing. Next we have the Watchers in the Dark. This, these guys I am the least familiar with out of some of the lore. They are mostly associated with the Dark Angels Legion and the Dark Angels chapters. Essentially, they look kind of like Jawas. They're short, they wear a hood. And any features beyond that, we don't know. There, there's just darkness where you would see features of a face or anything like that within them. And so I don't know what theory specifically this iceberg is claiming about the Watchers. But essentially, the Watchers are considered a higher dimensional being that watches over humanity. And it says that over the last like 15,000 years in one book that... They have been helping to cultivate human culture and humans in general because in their dimension they're a lot like humanity so they have an affinity with us in that way but they seem to be very ancient enemies of chaos in their own dimension and so that's why they're motivated to help humanity in our dimension and you know appear to us as these small beings because they want to help defeat chaos and they see humanity as a great hope to do that apparently is what i would guess with them there is one excerpt of a demon seeing one of these beings and essentially just seeing darkness where they would hope to see a soul. And it expressed that the demon could not feel fear, but it was greatly discomforted by being in the presence of one of these beings. And it doesn't seem like the Watchers in the Dark are afraid of the demons themselves. They seem to be some kind of anti-form to the demons and to the warp itself being from that other dimension they're from. One person had the idea that they could be some form of Catan shards that are benevolent to humanity and working with them, but no member of the Catan are really anti psyker so to speak, or really like cause warp creatures to be afraid of them, so to speak. If anything, the Catan can't comprehend the warp at all, really. And yeah, they want to shut it down, but it's because they 
woefully can't understand it at all and don't really want to deal with it. It's completely out of their realm of understanding, essentially. And so then the last one here for this part of the iceberg is the Terminus Decree's true purpose is to shut down the Golden Throne. And so I'm not sure how old this theory really is, but we kind of know a bit more about that from the end of the death part one, two, and three now. We know that the Terminus Decree was created by Basilius Foe, who is an ancient enemy of the Emperor, basically a rival lord or emperor of his own right in his day. And he was a master of biological power, essentially. So he is like a master scientist, much like the emperor is, but a rival one to his uh, you know, motivations and powers. Foe was released from prison by the Adeptus Custodes and Malkador's chosen members, and their goal was to have him create essentially a biological contagion that would target the gene markers of space marines and primarchs and basically wipe all of them out. Uh, if it ever, you know, got spread to them, essentially. And so the Terminus Decree is that. So it doesn't have anything to do with the Golden Throne directly. So I'm pretty sure this is before those books came out, of course. But really what this refers to more now is the Talisman of Seven Hammers, which is what Vulcan created as like a final failsafe on the Golden Throne. Should the forces of chaos ever break through into the throne room or another major enemy to the Imperium, and the Emperor is not able to fight them off or otherwise dies on the throne. The Talisman of Seven Hammers is there to detonate and basically consume a large part of the solar system as well as the warp in that area with psionic fire and flame, kind of like as a final, you know, punch in the face to chaos if it ever came down to that. So it doesn't really shut down the throne so much as destroy everything around it. As far as we know, there is no failsafe to shut down the Golden Throne, really. And in just one of my recent videos on the Great Knights, the Terminus Decree and what it does is apparently on Titan, the moon of Saturn, in the care of the Great Knights chapter of Space Marines right now, to be enacted only at the behest of the Grand Masters, the Great Knights, if uh, there is ever a direction to do so. But it's not certain that the Grey Knights, even the Grand Masters, know that the decree truly can, you know, kill every space marine in Primark. They just know that it was something left over from Malkador's wishes from 10,000 plus years ago. And that's it for the tip of the iceberg and going into the shallow waters here. That was a lot of content to cover here. So really, I'm, I think I'm going to stop here because there's a lot more to go and I do want to get into it, but I want to see how this first video does. And so if you did like this content, Please like and subscribe if you have not already. Please leave a comment if you have any questions or want to discuss any part of this iceberg, this video. I love discussing the lore with you in the comments here. And hopefully this will get picked up by the YouTube gods and encourage me to continue on with this iceberg here. Because this is a good way of just kind of touching on a bunch of lore that I know and helping some of you learn of it. And maybe perceiving it in different ways than you have in the past if you were familiar with it like me. So as always, I appreciate your time here. If you've liked this, I hope to see you in the next video. And I hope you have a great week coming up here after this Monday. And that you have a great week at work or whatever it is you have planned for this week. And I will see you in the next video. Thank you and talk with you soon. Thank <laughs> you.